The repair and activation of the sensors was successful, and Alain looked proudly at the output and directional chart of the last couple of days. Only a few minor objects, and they weren't coming anywhere near the ships. He folded the printout and slid it into his suit's external pocket and prepared for another easy day of work. He guessed the Sylth used a similar pattern for removing sensitive equipment, headed to the last location he'd seen them, and went around the area to see if he could pick up any sign of them on his pocket detector. It displayed a target soon and a detour through a corridor that wasn't squeezed tight later. He saw lights from behind a couple of narrow breaches in another compartment. He waved his light and noticed the Sylth turning towards him, then pulled out the printout and held it out through one gash in the twisted wall. What's this, said Asitha when the human stuck his hand through the gap. What's what, asked Tynus over the radio. The human wants to give me something. Really? Asita pushed herself gently towards the gap and looked at the folded paper in the human's glove. Carefully, because she still didn't trust him, she took the paper and he pulled back his hand. With a little effort, she separated two sides and unfolded the paper. It's a map. Tynes's curiosity rose. A map of what? Asitha examined the ellipses on one side and the lines with circles and arrows on the other side. This solar system, our position is marked by a tilted rectangle and, she examined the objects marked with crosses, an obvious symbol shaped like a feline head and one shaped like a human head, all with directional arrows and human numbers. I think the objects crossing this system and the cargo probes sent by both our sides. She estimated the distance in time and nodded. Yes, I'm pretty sure these are the probes arriving soon. Tynes smiled at the extra sense of security. Then he succeeded in activating an early warning system for our protection. He did, yes, Asitha said. From now on, we're not to underestimate his abilities. You think we can trust him now, even just a little bit? Asitha considered it for a moment. I still can't let go of my suspicions, but maybe we can trust him to protect himself and us being lucky if we happen to reap any benefit from it. The Sylth folded the printout again and held it out to Alain. He took it, and this time it was the Sylph that lit its helmet light and bowed its rusty red-brown head. He thought its eyes were green and they were a good match to its fur color. The Sylph turned off its helmet light and Alain lit his to return a friendly smile. He put up his hand and left the compartment to get on with work, satisfied he'd achieved a friendly exchange with both Sylph. On his way, he decided to call them Snow Height and Red Riding Hood until he could learn their names. He just hoped he wasn't wrong in guessing they were both female. Judging from the generic differences in silt appearances between the males and females, as stated in the information the humans had collected on them. If they were male, they'd most likely have a thicker muzzle inherited from their animal ancestors and longer fur around their chin, like a beard with human males. It did make him wonder why the Sylph had sent two females for this project and speculated they might handle being out here better than the more aggressive males. He'd just have to wait until he got a chance to find that out, along with the other things he was curious about. Alain watched the squarish supply probe land on its spindly legs and clamp to the hull with its magnetic feet from inside the crew pod, and headed out to unload the supplies it brought and load it with the containers full of the components he had recovered during the first period. He was glad to be in space for once so he wouldn't have to haul the heavy containers bogged down by gravity. While he was busy, the Sylph probe arrived as expected from the early warning status. And according to the schedule the Sylph and Earth had agreed on for the probe visits. He watched the similar bulky design with retractable feet touch down near their pod and Snow Height and Red getting to work. They even greeted him first when they noticed him and he greeted back while an idea popped up in the back of his head. They were nearly done loading the probe when Tynus tapped Asitha on her shoulder. Asitha! The human! She turned to face her friend and saw her pointing towards the front of the Amaroth. What the? She said when she saw the human crossing the wrecked fronts of the ship towards them. Does he want to cause an incident? He came down and planted his feet on the Amaroth and stood there with something in his hand. Is he armed? Asked Tynus and tried to remember where the weapons were stored in the pod. Asitha squinted at the shiny object while he unfolded a piece of paper. I don't think so. Seems he has something else to show us. Should we have a look? 
I have a screwdriver in my belt, so if he does try something, I can pierce his suit and maybe wound him, she said. We'll have a closer look first. Alan hoped the risk of entering their territory was worth it while he watched the two Sylph moving closer along the hull. They could launch a complaint or even kill him without much consequence, with him breaking the agreement, although he hadn't technically. He'd read the agreement, and it stated boarding the vessel, and he hadn't boarded it. He didn't worry about the systems detecting him because they didn't register anything outside the ship, and he was quite sure they hadn't replaced the sensors to detect trespassers in the direct sections of the ship. He hadn't anyway on the Walkyria. Asitha and Tynus stopped at a little distance from the human and took a stance on the hull. The human waited for a moment before holding up the paper and showing the shiny object more clearly. Is that a bottle he's holding? Asked Tynus. I think so, but why? Isn't it a tradition to give them away in human culture? Just like we do sometimes? Let's find out. Asitha said and stepped closer. The human held out the paper, and Asitha took it. Tynus giggled when she read the crude silth handwriting. Good festival for first-time probe arrive. Asitha chuckled. I really don't understand this human. What is he thinking? Tynus looked at the bottle. I get it now. They use any excuse to drink. If I were human, I'd be drinking as much as I could too, said Asitha. To be honest, I would fancy a good drink. If only we could get a supply out here. Tynus sighed. I know what you mean. She looked at the human. Shall we accept? Asitha looked at the patiently waiting human in front of them. There was something about him that made her understand why Tynes helped him with his tools that time. We will, she said, and stepped closer to a human than she'd ever imagined she'd do. He held out the bottle. She took it with both hands and bowed in gratitude. We don't have anything in return, though she said, and pondered how to convey it to him. Alam watched the sylph gesture at the bottle, then the length of the ship, and put her hands together, leaving a little space between them. He knew what she meant because he had looked up any information on drinking in sylph culture he could find. Their military forbade alcohol, and the sylph drank only on occasion in their society. He turned on his helmet light and nodded, then turned it off and gestured at his head, pointed at the bottle, at the sylph in front of him, then repeated the gesture of putting his hands together. He put his hand against his chest, pointed at the bottle again, back at the Amaroth, and spread his hands. Does he mean what I think he means? Asked Tynus. He knows we don't have any, and says he has a lot. I think so, said Asitha. He must know about as much about us as we do about humans, perhaps even more. She turned on her helmet light, bowed her head, and smiled a little because she began to find this human interesting. Alain smiled when Red looked thankful, and Tennis showed him a smile as well. He gave them a slight bow and put up his hand as he stepped backwards. I hope you'll enjoy it, he said and turned to climb over the tangle of the warship hulls. He turned around when he reached the Walkyria and saw Snow Height and Red still standing on the other side. They waved once at him and he returned it before they went back towards their crew pod. He returned to his pod, cleared the probe for launch, and poured himself a drink while watching the probe take off. He lifted his glass towards the sylph side. Here's to our first accomplishment. Tynes unscrewed the cap from the bottle and sniffed it. Yipe, she said as she scrunched her nose. This smells really strong. All the better, said Asitha as she put down two small cups. If it's a ploy to take us out, I'd like to get knocked out good beforehand. Tynes looked at Asitha with big eyes. You think it's poisoned? Asitha chuckled. No, I'm beginning to think the human's harmless enough and is just being friendly. She pushed her cup towards Tynes. Fill them up. We've deserved a decent break from all the work they're pushing on to us. Days continued and whenever they saw each other, Alan and the girls would exchange a greeting. Tynes removed her helmet in their crew pod after she and Asita ended their shift. We're done for today, right? Hmm, hummed Asita while she stepped out of her suit. Then I think I'm going to explore for a bit. Asita gazed at her. What for? I've been thinking the captain and highest officers would have to entertain high members of the party once in a while, right? Asitha nodded. So? Tines chuckled. I don't believe they wouldn't have a small amount of mushka on board. Asitha let out a laugh. You want to go look for that? Tines replaced the air supply of her suit. Yes, Asitha sat down. And I thought I needed a drink, Tines giggled. 
it's not that, for the most part. I just thought if there was enough, we could give the human a bottle to return the favor. Ah, uh, Asitha said. Not a bad idea, actually. It's better to be on friendly terms in the end anyway. No need to continue with the same hostility between our species. Tynes smiled a little at Asitha. You certainly have relaxed your view. Asitha sighed and leaned back. Being out here on our own gets me thinking. I doubt they'll call us back anytime soon. And if we want to stay sane and safe, we'd better work together as much as we can. Tynes picked up her helmet. Coming then? Asitha looked at her suit's small status screen. Why not? The captain's quarters were quickly located and the girls shone their lights through the dark room, illuminating a variety of items that had began floating around over time. Only the furniture attached to the floor had stayed put while a couple of chairs floated just above the floor at a tilt. I'll take this side, said Asitha and pushed herself towards a long and low cabinet. Found it, said Tynes, after forcing the lock on a built-in cabinet in the corner behind the desk. She shone her light on the floating mess of bottles and glasses. We can definitely spare one or two bottles for the human. This captain must have liked his shot of the good stuff. Isitha hissed in a high tone through her teeth at the sight. Our luck. Tynus shone her light around the room again. See if you can find some bags or something. Now that we found this, I don't want to leave a single bottle behind. Alan hauled himself along the rungs and rails towards the front of the warship, even though his next target for retrieval wasn't that far forward. But he hoped to see the silth and suggest opening a communication channel between them. He was glad they appeared from behind their pod before he reached the hatch he'd had to use. He stuck up his hand and received a reaction from them. While they were on their way towards him, he kept going over the arguments to convince them of the advantages of his idea and what he'd try as an alternative if they rejected it. If they did, he supposed he'd have to think of ways to gain enough of their trust. One of them put up its hand again when they drew near, and he responded with a quick wave of his own. He moved towards the crushed hull, but stopped when the Sylth climbed across it from their side and waited patiently for them to set foot on the walk urea. Hey there, he said and stepped closer to them. One of them presented a bottle and he chuckled. I guess we made a promising first contact. Tynus held out the bottle of Mushka and the human bowed when he took it. He lit his helmet light for a moment to show his gratefulness. She giggled when he examined the bottle and gave them a thumbs up and bowed back. I think he likes it. Seeing what his present tastes like, I doubt he wouldn't like one of our favorite bad habits, Asitha said. The sill stepped back, but Alon quickly put up his hand. It came to him in the spur of the moment, but he couldn't pass up the chance. He gestured with a sweep of his hand towards his pod behind and pointed at the bottle, then at the sylph and himself. His heart beat faster while he watched and waited for a reaction. Did he just invite us to drink with him? Said Asita. Looks like it to me, said Tynes. You think we can? Not while there are sensors to keep either of us from each other's warship. Asita said and pointed at the ship and at herself and Tynes. Elan did a mental facepalm. Of course, he said and typed a few commands on the small touchscreen attached to his forearm. When the sensor's status returned as offline, he gave the Sylth another thumbs up and gestured at his crew pod again. He turned off their detection system, said Tynes. Does he trust us not to take advantage of the situation? I have no idea what he's thinking, apart from maybe hoping we'll follow him to drink with him. Tynes bit her lower lip. Can we trust him not to lure us into a trap? Asita pondered for a moment. Although we can't be certain just yet that he's really alone, he'd have to have some confidence to invite the two of us into his pod while he's alone. She chuckled at the thought of seeing a human face to face for real. I think it's a good opportunity to find out more about the humans. Drinking while observing them doesn't hurt either. Tanis giggled. All right, so we go. Alan smiled when the sylph stepped forward and he felt his curiosity growing while he led them along the Walkurea's hull to his pod. All three were affected by nervousness while Alain opened the airlock and entered it. A sweat drop crawled down his forehead and he cursed silently, hoping he wouldn't leave a disgusting impression of himself. Then he realized the whole pod would still smell of him, and he regretted he hadn't yet hooked up the Walkurea's filtration system to the pod. He sighed and resigned himself to the situation. Nothing he could do about it any longer. Tynus hesitated when she took hold of the handrail next to the open airlock.
Is this really going to be all right? She asked, way thinking the human might think them weird or inferior because sylph resemble one of their favorite animals they keep as pets. Asitha took a deep breath. We're here now, might as well go all the way, she said. We can't worsen relations between our species any more than they already are. Tynus put one foot on the airlock. Yeah, she said and pulled herself inside before she lost her nerve. The lock was a little cramped with the three of them inside, but cycling the environment was quick, and Alam was glad to step into the pod's roomier entrance and take off his helmet. He hung it in the suit's locker and turned towards the sylph. You can hang your suits there if you want to, he said as he gestured at two empty lockers on the side. He clenched his jaw slightly while waiting for their next move and relaxed a little when they unlocked the sill of their helmets. The three of them gazed at each other after Asitha and Tynus had removed their helmets. Alan swallowed quickly at the sight of the two felines so close to him. The urge to pet them fought with the realization that they were just as dangerous as the large predators on Earth. Asitha tried to read his expression, but there was no movement of his ears to indicate his mood. Tynus gazed at the misty gray eyes going from her to Asitha and back. They gave her a sense of curiosity and honesty even if she had never seen another human's eyes before. Beeping from the airlock nearly startled Alan. Crap, he said while his heart pounded and he closed the inner airlock door. He was glad for the distraction though and gestured at the open door towards the common quarters where crew members could sit, eat, and work. Nyar! Oh? Asitha said when she recognized the silth word for invitation despite his pronunciation. He knows our primary language. This human is interesting, said Tines. Asitha flicked one ear. That only means we have to be more careful around him, she said. I don't like it when others know more about me than I about them. Do you want to go back? Asitha watched Alain taking off his suit. No, not yet anyway. There doesn't seem to be any danger to us so far, she said and began to detach the upper half of her suit, and Tines unsealed hers. Asitha chuckled silently when Alain quickly picked a dirty plate and cup from the table at the side of the compartment and put them in the dishwasher. At least that's a common thing, she thought and looked around the small space. It's a little bigger than ours. Tines looked at Alain placing the mushka on the table with three small cups and two bottles of which she could guess what they contained. Maybe they need more space because they're so busy all the time. Asitha pricked up her ears. I heard they were as lazy as they could get away with. Tynes chuckled when Alain wiped the table in a hurry. I doubt this one's one of them. He gestured at the couch at one side of the table. Have a seat. The girls slipped onto it, and he noticed how they tucked their tails along the side of one leg. He suspected they kept it in one of their suit's legs because they were thicker than the ones from human suits. He slipped onto the opposite couch, unscrewed the cap of the mushka, filled the three cups to the brim, and took his. The girls noticed his lips moving before he spoke up. Vosh! Asitha let out a laugh and picked up her cup. Vosh! she said with clear pronunciation. Vosh! said Alain again, and Tynes giggled and picked up her cup. Vosh! she said, and they downed their drinks. Whoa, said Alain when the heat spread from his mouth and nose down through his chest and abdomen. I would visit your planet just to drink more of this. Asitha grinned at the hot face of the human. He likes it. Tynes laughed while he filled their cups again. He sure does. Alain relaxed more at the notion that the two silth were no direct threat and likely very friendly hanging around with. He tried not to, but he couldn't stop gazing at the creatures sitting across from him. The fur on the arms of one was like a red tabby from one of his old neighbors, mostly dark orange with lighter stripes, and she had alert green-yellow eyes. He made a conscious effort to ignore the obvious bumps underneath the white tank top she wore. He couldn't make out any bumps underneath the other Sils tank top because of her very fluffy and bright white fur filling her top, while her clear blue eyes reminded him of the clear summer skies when he visited his grandparents as a kid out in the country and were just as distracting. He wondered what their names were and smacked himself mentally for the first thing one's supposed to do when meeting new people. He put his hand on his chest. Alam, the red silth put her hand on her chest. Asitha, she said, and the other followed with Tynus. He lifted his cup. Crash course Ruwara, Asitha, Tynus. He said in the best silth he could speak after some practice in the days before. 
He hoped he really said welcome to his pod, which he named Crash Course just for fun. Tynes giggled and lifted her cup. She she. Alon chuckled and gestured at his mouth in her. You know a word or two of our common language. She held her flat hand just above the table to indicate she knew only a little. He nodded, pointed at himself, and repeated her gesture. Same here, he said, then picked up the bottle of mushka. But there's one thing everyone understands without knowing the language. Drink, Lash! The two self lifted their cups. Lash! Alam picked up a tablet from a shelf behind him and started the language module to help with the conversation. I'm glad you took my invitation, he said in the mix of words and gestures. I worry that we'd start things on a hostile foot, like our home worlds. Asitha nodded. We don't want to spend our time here as enemies either. But there are some things I want to know before I can begin to trust you. Alain nodded and refilled the cups. I'll tell you what I can, he said, as long as you don't ask about confidential subjects. Ositha looked deep into Alain's soft gray eyes, noticing the hint of caution in them, which she expected. He didn't look like the images she'd seen of human males before. They were either as bulky as silt males and often barely dressed, or they wore black clothing and wallowed in luxuries. This one looked a bit worn with his black head for a mess and the upper half of his face bare and the lower half shaved. She wondered for a moment how a silt male would look like with the fur on his face gone, but quickly dismissed it. There were more important questions. Are you alone here? Ah, Alon said and leaned back. I expected you'd have noticed by now that I am indeed alone here on this warship. One of Asitha's large feline ears turned forwards, just like Tynes's ears did while she looked at him over her cup as she sipped from it. We were supposed to come here with two men, but the other one got into an accident at the last moment, and we had no direct replacement, Alain said and took a drink. They said they'd find someone else to join me here, but I doubt anyone will come soon. Very few who are qualified and willing to stay for an unknown duration out here. So he's really alone, said Tynes softly. Asitha frowned a little at Alain. Then how were you able to activate this warship almost completely on your own? Something the size of this needs a crew to run. Alon chuckled and suppressed a proud grin. I can't give you the details, but for someone who has the right experience, it can be done. Let's just say I know my way around systems most people have never bothered learning about nowadays. Asitha twitched her ear. That's difficult to believe. Alon took another drink and picked up the tablet. Keep an eye on the forward section he said with a gesture of his head at the window, and typed several commands. Asitha and Tines looked at the hull of the Walkyra and held their breath when all the missile hatches opened at the same time the laser turret spun around. Tines looked at Alain. How did you do that? Alain smiled knowingly. As I said, the right experience, he said, and closed the hatches and returned the turrets to their parking positions. It saved me the trouble of needing to check everything by hand. I know the status of most equipment and only need to look at those that failed to react or returned error codes. He put the tablet on the table again and leaned back with his cup. Asita stared at the tablet. We weren't sure whether you were making a statement of force when you lit up the ship before. Alam froze midway and taking another drink. Ah, no, that wasn't my intention. I just ran my script to trigger everything and get a list of what did and didn't respond. Asita nodded. Yes, I see now, she looked straight at him. If you did feel hostile towards us, you wouldn't have invited us or gave us what was it called again? Alain smiled a little. Genevere. Aisita pricked up her ear. Genevere. She fingered her cup. I think we don't have to worry about any enmity between us. Exactly what I hoped for, he said. We're all alone out here and I'd like to leave political matters back at the homeworld. I think that's a good excuse to drink to, said Tynus and topped off the cups. For as long as the supply lasts, at least. I suppose when your side left the Amaroth, they took everything with them. Tynus nodded. Didn't they with your ship? Alon grinned. They didn't take everything, and there's several local storages that include a good stock of food and drinks. And unlike your rules, I can order a decent amount for myself, so we're not running out anytime soon. Tynes's eyes grew wide and her ears pricked up. You're willing to share it with us? Alain stood up and opened the pod's mini-fridge. I have no problem with that. Drinking on my own isn't as much fun anyway, 
he said and placed a large plate with a variety of small sausages on the table. And best of all, most of what was left aren't rations. Asita picked up a sausage, stared at it for a moment, sniffed it, and carefully tasted it. She hummed. Good. Tynus took one and tried it. She hummed in satisfaction. Much better than the standard food they're sending us. Alam picked one and started chewing. I don't know if you like spices, but I could give you some to try and improve the taste of your food. I heard you humans like food that burns your mouth. I don't think we'll like that. Alain laughed once. Some of us certainly do. I like to eat something a little hot once in a while too, but there's a lot more than just the hot stuff to give taste to ingredients. Tynes looked at Asitha. Then we'll try some of your spices, Shishi. Anything to make our stay here a more pleasant one, Alain said and dropped another sausage in his mouth. Any trouble doing your side of the recovery? Asitha shot him a suspicious look. Oh, I don't mean to find out anything about your technology, just the general curiousness of learning if the job's giving you the same trouble as mine. I can tell you some places I need to go are troublesome to get to because of the crushed corridors. Asitha nodded. There's much damage and it does prevent us from finding out if the equipment there still has value. Alan leaned forward. Isn't there a way to reach it remotely? If you can get a response from the systems, You'll know whether they're working or not, and if they're not worth the trouble to get to in the first place. Asitha shook her head. Even if there is, we don't know how. Alain leaned back and looked at his tablet. I have no knowledge of your systems, but the challenge tickles me. You're not allowed to enter the Amaroth, so don't even try. We'll have to report you. I know, Alain said and chuckled. It's just that I have a thing for technology, and I'm curious about almost anything. I won't try anything unless I get permission. Do you even have time for anything other than the work you're supposed to do? Alain grinned again. I already know what I can write off for certain and don't have to bother looking at. And since they sent me here on my own because of the deadline, I use that as an excuse to do less than half the work we're expected to do with two people. He gestured back at Earth behind him. Let's see them complain when they force the situation themselves. I'm not going to try my best on this. Tynus sighed. If we try that, we'd get in trouble. Really, who's going to come here and inspect what you're doing? They had some people estimate how much work could be done and created the orders from that. If you keep falling short, they'll have to accept that their estimate's too high, and they'll set it according to what you deliver. But we already sent a full shipment back, said Asitha. Alan shrugged. Just tell them you were lucky or began on the easy stuff first to retrieve as much as possible before it could fall into our dangerous human hands. Tynes giggled. Those humans might plot to spy on our systems, so the faster we pull out the circuits that are easily reached, the harder it'll be for them to steal them. Alain smiled at her. Yes. Asitha chuckled. I don't know. Alain leaned towards her. What could they do? They're not here. Asitha looked at Alain's face, then emptied her cup. All right, we'll try it. But if we get any trouble, we'll blame it on you. Alain smirked and filled her cup again. Be my guest. Tynes giggled and Asitha looked at her. What's so funny? She grinned at Asitha and Alain. Us. Us? Two sylph and a human drinking together on the crashed warships of our feuding worlds. Alain snorted his drink through his nose and the girls laughed while he scrambled for a towel to wipe his face and blow his nose. Oh, fuck, that stings, he said while his voice was muffled by the towel. The girls were still giggling when he returned to the table with red eyes and a very red nose. I now wonder why they ever thought humans were a threat to us, Asitha said with a big smirk. Alon wiped the last tears from his eyes. Don't underestimate me. I can wave the missile bay doors at you again. Ooh, said Asitha and flattened her ears. What will us poor Silth do? Maybe we can wave a weapons manual in retaliation. Alan took a careful sip from his drink again. I'll surrender if you'll start throwing them, he said, and the girls giggled. Tynes sighed. I'm too sleepy to pretend war now. You're safe. Alan chuckled. Saved by the booze. Esita finished her drink. Indeed. We have just enough time to sleep before our next shift starts. Alan stood up. Before you go, there's something I want to suggest. 
She watched him pull the communicator from his suit and activate it. Do you mind opening a private channel with me? It's easier than waiting at the bow each time for one of us to show up. And in case there's an emergency, like an object heading our way, being picked up by the Walkuria's detection systems. Asitha looked at Tynas, who nodded. She stood up and headed for her own suit. All right, I see no harm in that, and as you said, it'll be useful, she said and returned with her own communicator. They scanned the range of frequencies until they settled on a common one. Alain smiled at Asitha. Now I can brag about being able to call every girl in the solar system. She giggled. There's only the two of us. He waved the argument away. Technicalities. The girls checked each other's suits after donning them, and Alain cycled the airlock for them from inside. Tynus giggled again when she and Asitha looked back at the pod and Alain giving them a quick wave through a window. I would have never imagined I'd be getting near a human or even drinking with one, she said and returned the wave. Asitha did the same and chuckled. True. I expected this job they pushed onto us to be tiring, but maybe it'll turn out to be interesting instead.